Hello everyone. Welcome to the attic. My name is Carol and you are watching the Piedmont Trails channel. Thank you everyone for joining me this evening. Tonight's topic is about Washington County from North Carolina to Tennessee. Now there is a county in North Carolina named Washington County that is located on the eastern coastline. But tonight we're not talking about that county. We're talking about the first Washington County, North Carolina, which was actually located on the eastern border of Tennessee. And with that, we're going to be talking and dealing strictly with the colonial records. I'm going to be naming about 70 surnames tonight of early settlers. We're going to go through the timeline of this fascinating history that's involved with eastern Tennessee. And then we're going to um, going to list some resources and genealogy records, over 10,000 documents that of families that have been proven of their lineage to early families in eastern Tennessee. So all that's coming up. So say hi to me. Let me know that you're here. The live chat is up and running. Melissa, hello. Good evening to you. And I see Christina. Hi, Christina. I hope everyone is doing well this evening and has had a fantastic weekend. We are, hi, Rick. I just seen you popped in from Texas. And we are into the new season. We're in the autumn season. I hope everyone has been enjoying it and getting ready for holidays coming up and all kinds of good stuff. So, chats, the hi, Elaine. I just seen you popped in too. Good evening to you. All right, so we're going to get started, and like I said, I'll stop like I usually do. I'll stop periodically. Hi, Danny. I just seen you popped in. Welcome. Welcome to the attic. Um, I will stop periodically, and I'll read your comments, but I want you guys to meet new friends tonight and talk amongst yourselves and have a really good time. That's what it's all about, is enjoying the journey to the past. So um, that is what we are all about. Okay, before I go any further with the resources and starting to name some of these surnames, um, I conducted a thorough investigation of Eastern Tennessee a couple of years ago, back in 2020, and the latter part of 2019. So if you visit PiedmontTrails.com and go to the search tab on the website and enter in either Eastern Tennessee or you can enter in Watauga Settlement, uh, Watauga Association, uh, Nolichucky River, Holston River, any of those search terms, and you will be able to pull up from the archives our articles and our ground research from that time. Um, I was trying to count earlier today how many, I, I think there's six or seven articles that we had published back in 2020, and it also lists several surnames of early families, some land-grant documentations, um, and also some other research uh, links too. So be sure to do that because all of the links and information I'm going to share with you tonight will, um, there may be additional more resources on the website that you can get. And I also want to stress here that I will put all the links and the resources that I mentioned tonight on our Piedmont Trails community page on the YouTube channel. So if you don't have pencil and paper, don't worry. I will put them all on the community page with links so that all you'll have to do is just visit that page and then read which one you're interested in, click on it, and then go. So it's all simple, okay? All right. So I'm going to uh, begin with these surnames. And I'm going to start. They're over 70. And it has just started raining here. So if you can hear the rain hitting the uh, roof of the attic, which is really cool. All right, so here we go. Here we go with the surnames. John Bean, William Bean. The, they lived along Boone's, Boone Creek. Boone's Creek. Uh, William Bean owned about 400 acres, and he is a very early settler. William Blavins, Jacob Brown, Aaron Burlinson, Thomas Butler, John Calloway, Richard Calloway, Alexander Campbell. He lived along Limestone Creek. As notes come to me, as I read these names, I'll recite it off to you. Emmanuel Carter. Um, John Carter. He lived along Cane Creek. Landon Carter. Uh, he owned around 2,000 acres. Gilbert Christian. Henry Clark. William Clark. William Clawson. William Cook. 
John Coulter, John Crawford, Moses Crawford, Samuel Crawford, Julius Duggar, Daniel Dunham, Jesse Dunham, John Dunham, John Farrer, William Farrer, William Falling, Adam Gain, G-A-N-N, -N, Abraham Gray, Adam Greer, um, last name is Hall, first initial was A. This individual, I could not, never figure out his first name, but he lived along Sinking Creek. He owned approximately 200 acres there. John Hart, Thomas Hart, Joshua Holton, Thomas Holton, uh, Zachariah Isbell, Peter Jefferson, Isaac Johnston, John Johnston, William Johnston, John Laterell, Aaron Lewis, Mordecai Price, Thomas Price, James Range, Peter Range, Aaron Rawlings, John Reed, Abraham Rise, Charles Robertson, James Robertson, John Severe, Valentine Severe, Evan Shelby, Isaac Shelby, Adam Sherrill, James Smith, John Smith, William Smith, uh, William Tarham, Joseph Barron, Felix Walker, William Walker, Adam Wilhite, Curtis Williams, Edmund Williams, George Williams, John Williams, Adam Wilson, Samuel Wilson. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, 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 many more, many more. But these are all early family settlers. If you, I'm going to say some key words to you guys. And when I do, I'll try to signify that these are key words that you'll need to use to look up for other sources. But Watauga Association, if you've never heard of them, the Watauga Association was created in 1772 by families living along the Watauga River in present-day Elizabethton. If you've never visited, uh, visited Sycamore Shoals State Historic Park, it's an excellent place to start if you're able to actually visit the location in eastern Tennessee and do your actual groundwork there. I would start at Sycamore Shoals. That's where all most of the early families settled at, and this is where the Watauga Association was established in 1772. Several small forts were established um, all along the Watauga River, Nolichucky River, and Holston River. Fort Caswell was one of the first ones. It was later known as Fort Watauga. The families devised their own treaties. This is important because this is what makes this area so much different from other areas that were settled um, during this, especially during this time period. These families took it upon themselves to um, deal, create lease agreements with the local Cherokee tribes for their lands. And they did this um, for, according to documents, for 10 years. The first lease, uh, lease agreements were for 10 years. These families created that. Now, in other colonies, I have discovered um, other types of contracts in other different colonies. And I know, understand Tennessee was not a colony then. I understand it, but at the time it was part of North Carolina. But this, um, what I'm trying to say here is that this was not unheard of, and it did occur. But for some reason, due to the time period of when this happened in Tennessee, later on when the state of Franklin was coming into on the scene, this was looked down upon for the early families that were living in eastern Tennessee. And I, we'll get into that, and I'll explain why. Um, let's go back to this timeline because I want to do this timeline real quick before we go any further with these um, research and documents and materials and other stuff. So start out with 1776, the families that were living in this area petitioned for North Carolina to recognize the Washington district and they named their own district. They called it, uh, named it Washington after George Washington. All right. And then they petitioned to North Carolina for them to be recognized, which North Carolina did not do at that time. But in 1777, North Carolina did, and they created Washington County. In 1784, the eastern sections of Tennessee declared their independence from North Carolina due to neglect and misuse. Now, that could be a whole separate topic right there that we could do um, for information because of that, because it was neglect for military, fortify their forts, um, 
they needed assistance with some of the native tribes in the area that were attacking the forts, attacking some of the families. Um, also, there were le um, land speculators who were arriving in the area who were actually taking part in seizing property of families who were already there. They were seizing upon the moment for them to own land because North Carolina was recognizing this as a county, so they wanted to get the head start and get a jump on the land deals. Um, so all of that comes into play when it comes down to where in 1784 they decide they want to be free from North Carolina. So in 1785, a petition was submitted from Washington County, Tennessee, known to in Tennessee at that time, submitted to Congress to approve a new state named Franklin. It was named, they picked this name out, and named it after Benjamin Franklin. The vote was cast, but it was lost by two votes. It did not make it because of two votes. In 1789, North Carolina refused to recognize the new county within the state of Franklin territory. Meantime, Franklin is growing. So they've divided out their Washington County into several, two other counties. But North Carolina's not recognizing them. Um, they're not recognizing their land deals. None of this. Okay. So when they, this is the same year that North Carolina had became a state and the area is known today as Tennessee was then ceded back to the United States. And then Tennessee later became, Tennessee at that time became part of the Southwest Territory. So you can see this back and forth. You've got to picture yourself as a family living along Watauga River or Nolichucky River. And you're hearing on all of this and you're trying to survive out in the wilderness and your family, you're not receiving any aid from your North Carolina, from your colony. Okay, while, while the other settlements down below the Western Mountains are receiving fort aid, they're getting military assistance, they have their own committee of safety, they are, um, they're, or, they're organized. So that required Watauga Association to create their own government, which they pretty much did. They had to in order to have legal, um, to have some type of representation and to have moral conduct amongst themselves and uh, to create rules to live by. Okay. So in 1792, when North Carolina annexed back the land that today is recognized as um, Allegheny County, so uh, Ash County and Watauga County, they did not take back Eastern Tennessee. They didn't want it. So in 1792, North Carolina took back Watauga, Allegheny and Ash County uh, back as part of their, of their state. They did not want Tennessee, but in 1796, then Tennessee becomes a state. So that's our timeline. Let me stop here for a minute. Christina says, I have a bean family in North Carolina, but no idea if the same region. Mary Polly Dean Park died in Rowan County, and I'm still researching. Oh, well, you just hold on. <laughs> you just hold on, Christina. We may have some answers for you then where you can look to search to find out for sure. Um, okay, let me see where I got left off on the other part here. Okay, the families devised their own treaties with the Cherokee, okay? But the relationship was tedious and often resulted in attacks on the forts in the area. And more and more people were arriving to the area and they were acquiring more land. So the Watauga Purchase, another key word, Watauga Purchase, which occurred on March 19, 1775, purchased the lands along the Watauga River for 2,000 pounds sterling. You can view this document online um, in its entirety, in its original format. The web address for that is at wctnarchives.org forward slash 6036-2 forward slash. Okay. Now, don't worry. I'll put that link up on the community page later. The names that appear on that particular contract are John Sevier, William Bailey Smith, Je Jesse Benton, Tillman Dixon, William Blevins, Thomas Price, and, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce these correctly, Akanistato, Atacolacoli, Tennessee Warrior and Willanawa. 
which were the Cherokee leaders that signed the document. The document is stored in the Washington County Deed Book A. It is in Deed Book A, which was recently returned back to its rightful owner, I heard, past, this past summer. Okay, now on March 25th in 1775, Jacob Brown, who was living in the Noli Chucky settlement, he created a same similar contract. And a digitized index is also available online from Deed Book A, which records the earliest date of March 1775 of the first recording. Now, do I believe families were living in this area before 1770? Yes, I do. And I do have proof that they were living in that area before 1770. Um, some cases for year, many years before 1770. So, yes, and you can find documentation and proof of them in various different uh, formats and locations, which we're going to get into. Um, some of these are diaries and journals. And uh, I will share the link to Deed Book A in Tennessee on the, inde the index for that whole entire Deed Book A on the community page after tonight's live stream. Okay. Now I want to back up just a second, and I want to mention that lease deal that dates to May of 1772. This was the original one that was made with the local Cherokee tribes. Um, the lease agreement was looked down upon by the British Crown. In other words, it was considered illegal, and they looked upon it that these families created an illegal act. And they in no way owned this property that they proclaimed that they did or in had any title to it, no matter what the lease agreements were with the native tribes. Now, several of the Cherokee leaders also did not uphold this agreement. And one of the most famous ones are Dragon Canoe, another key word. If you look him up, you will see um, various documents and actions that he took where he was in not supportive of this at all. Um, all of these events build up to prompt the organization of the Watauga Association. And this was pretty much a five-member court, which I believe consisted of the surnames Carter, Robertson, Greer, Severe, and Brown as one of the first five. The 1776 Watauga petition requested North Carolina to recognize the settlement, like I'd stated earlier. The settlers first requested recognition from Virginia. Not many people realize that. A lot of people didn't know that Virginia turned down these families as being a recognized settlement. But they were the first to turn them down. Even though the land boundaries belonged to the colony of North Carolina, the families looked up for, to Virginia for recognition and military um, safety, um, materials to enhance their forts, they looked to them for uh, support. But Virginia did turn them down. And that was in 1776. Um, so all of this builds up to the origins of the state of Franklin. Okay, so I'm going to get to the records now. If you go and all the tax lists are online for from set, beginning in 1778, um, there are a few years that are missing. It's 1782 through 1786. But from 1778 all the way through to 1799, except for those four years that I mentioned, are found online free to use. Um, I was looking here to see if I had put down the website, but I didn't. But I will put it on the community page. The wheel records are also available with the oldest dating to, of course, John Wood. I think we did a, an article or, or it might have been a presentation on Mr. John Wood. He passed, uh, he died in 1773, but that's the oldest wheel that we have been able to document. And majority of the records dating to the 18th century can be found at the Washington County, Tennessee Department of Records, Management, and Archives. I'll repeat that. That is the Washington County, Tennessee Department of Records, Management, and Archives. In other words, it's at wctnarchives.org. wctnarchives.org. Okay. 
All right, another great resource is a book by Samuel Cole Williams. Now, Samuel Cole Williams it is entitled The Dawn of Tennessee Valley and the Tennessee History. It was published by the Watauga Press in 1937. I actually don't have this book. Um, I looked it up online. Only one I could find that was available for sale was listed at $75. Went further, and I had a notes in a file for... Um, for Mr. Uh, Samuel Williams and noted that it was available online. So I do have that link for you guys. The entire book has been digitized and it is available online. And I'll put that on the community page. Another great source to use, and don't rule this out, but it's the NRHP documents, um, the National Register of Historic Places. Many of these will list reference points and they will also list survey maps and um, other materials that may link you to your family. Um, they're a great place to start if you don't, if you've run out of resources and you don't have any leads or clues, I highly suggest using these. Um, and also they're gonna lean you to learn more about the landscape. What was there? What wasn't there? What meals were here? Who lived here at the, near this meal? Prime example is Duncan's Meal along Brush Creek, which is near Watauga River. Uh, across from this original meal site, uh, meal site stands his three-story limestone home, which was built by Jeremiah Duncan. Another interesting one is the House of Colonel George Gillespie, which documents uh, state that the stagecoach actually ran right in front of his home from Philadelphia, stopping at his spring to water the horses and uh, allow the passengers for uh, to get a rest and to get water. So don't rule those out because um, especially for this, for Eastern Tennessee, they were good, very good. Daughters of the American Revolution and other groups uh, way back years ago were very good in documenting these old homes and researching them, cemeteries included. Um, and they were since named as National Historic Places. So when you pull up the PDFs, files on these you will get the resources a lot of times you'll get some of the original pictures road maps and so much more that can lead you to the direction you need to go to find your family okay so another great resource is a book published in 1996 by the Watauga Association of Genealogists and it is entitled the Tennessee Bible and Family Records um um, that title, again, is Tennessee Bible and Family Records, and it was published in 1996. Another great source is the Jonesboro Genealogical Society, and you can find them at jgstn.org. And they have a great book that is also available, which is entitled The Early Settlers of Washington County, Tennessee, dating 1768 to 1777. This is part of their project to identify the early settlers of Washington County, Tennessee. And I also want to add the Watauga Association of Genealogists of Northeast Tennessee, and you can find them at www, and I, I've got a nickname that I call these, but I'll share it with you in just a minute, www.wagsnetn.org. My nickname for them is WAGS. And there's a reason for that, because they originally, how I came across them was on Roots Web, uh, rootsweb.com, way back in the day, back in the 90s, 1990s. And um, I came across them. They have been um, a genealogical society, I think, since 1971. But they were very respected on Roots Web. And uh, I began genealogy research on some of my family members from that area in eastern Tennessee. And I went through them to uh, obtain a lot of the information at that time. So they have been around a long time. Very reliable source. Um, I encourage you all to attend at least one of their monthly meetings. And they, they are now having their monthly meetings on Zoom. And anyone can attend their meetings. Um, I was, let me see if I got more information on that. Then Yes, I do. The next uh, monthly meeting is scheduled on October the 4th at 7 p.m. And that and the name of this association, again, is Watauga Association of Genealogists, Northeast Tennessee, at www, 
dot w a g s n e t n dot org. My nickname for him is Wags. W a g s Wags. Great group, very great group. But yes, I I encourage everyone to um, join them on Zoom. One more resource is the North Carolina Land Grants. As of today, and I checked it before I came on here tonight. As of today, there are 12,076 land grants that date to the 18th century, and they are all located in the eastern portions of Tennessee. And where can you find these? You can find them at nclandgrants.com. It's nclandgrants.com. My friend David McCorkle is adding to this website, I think, almost daily. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm sure it's not daily. But it seems like every time I go on there, I see something new that I'm not seeing. So I wanted to get the current number of what is available on his website. And right now, that is the current number. Now, that's a lot of information a lot of land grants that you can actually pull up. You can see more information. Who were the chain carriers? Who were the survey? Who surveyed it? You can actually pull up the survey in many cases, find out exactly where the land was. But it's totaled up to 12,076 land grant records dating during the 18th century on East, in eastern Tennessee, present-day eastern Tennessee. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, how many of you guys knew that uh, what today is and how important it is in Tennessee history and to our history? Um, today is the anniversary of when the Ober Mountain men gathered together at Sycamore Shoals before they marched to uh, the Battle of Kings Mountain. 242 years ago today, September 25th, 1780, they gathered together at Sycamore Shoals and and decided they were going to march and participate in the independence of freedom. So amazing, amazing. All right, you guys. Now I'm going to reveal the largest collection. You ready? <laughs> okay, here we go. The largest collection pertaining to family genealogy with proven lineage can be found at the East Tennessee Historical Society. That's the East Tennessee Historical Society, Society and the First Families of Tennessee Project. You can access the material in the Calvin M. McClung Historical Collection, which is located at the East Tennessee History Center in Knoxville. It's on the third floor in Knoxville, Tennessee. I will include the website and contact information on the community page after the live stream. You're going to be overwhelmed when you go through this collection. It's tens of thousands of materials and documents, all from early families, um, proven lineage in the eastern sections of Tennessee, only in the eastern sections of Tennessee, dating early. Um, huge collection. Very huge collection. All right. Brian Sherrill is here. Howdy. Howdy to you, Brian. Okay. I felt like I ran through this. I had the rain over my head, so I didn't, I wasn't, wasn't sure if you guys could hear me or not. So I kind of talked a little loudly with the, because sometimes that rain can, can really sound loud on the roof here in the attic. Okay. So we are at the end of our presentation tonight. And I want to thank each of you for joining me this evening. If you missed some of the links, if you missed hearing some of the surnames, don't worry. You can always hit replay and you can always visit for those surnames. You can visit PiedmontTrails.com that I mentioned. They are on the article entitled Early Settlers of Washington County, Tennessee. And you can find the entire article on PiedmontTrails.com. Um, also, don't forget to look at the other articles that we did with our study back in 2020 and 2019. And I'll list all of these um, resources on the community page. Now, if you've never went through the um, McClung papers at the uh, Tennessee Historical Society, be, take, take a lot of 
know taking material with you and be prepared because it is a lot of material to go through but it's well worth it very much well worth it um i want to thank each of you for joining me this evening be sure to visit our community page on the channel for the resource links from tonight's stream uh, we have a podcast episode number 38 will be out this thursday on september the 29th and the show will discuss the colonial period in mississippi texas louisiana alabama and florida i just finished a book and i'm going to share this with you guys it's called coastal encounters the transformation of the gulf south on during the 18th century just finished that um some good points in this book that i liked um and there was a lot of information that was new to me that I will be including in um, to the podcast show this Thursday. A lot of people overlooked the records and how the Gulf area changed during the colonial period. It drastically changed. And um, including migrating trails of a lot of families who migrated to that area. So all that's coming up. That's coming up this Thursday, so be on the lookout for that. And uh, let's see, our next live stream will be on October the 30th, uh, the Sunday before Halloween, October the 30th at 7.30 p.m. We will also have a special presentation coming up really soon. I think we're going to do it in November about the Carolina Road. Uh, I've had a lot of people to contact me Um during the past, especially during the last two months. What about the Carolina Road? See, we've, we've not really mentioned the Carolina Road on our migration page on the website. So there's various reasons why, and I think it's time that we explain a little bit more about the Carolina Road and what we have found out. So that's coming up. I think it'll be in November. All right. I'm looking to see if there's any questions. I see happy faces and I see sunshine and Thank all. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. We really appreciate it. Really do. Um, thank you for subscribing to our Piedmont Trails YouTube channel. We really, really appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, you're the reason that we keep going through this and sharing all of this. So thank you so much. I hope you all find some fantastic treasures on your journey to the past this week. And may God bless each and every one of you.